the real Frank Zappa book as read by Fake Zappa, sponsored by the Ocean Spray Beverage Corporation. Chapter 3, page 38. An alternative to college. I got married for the first time when I was about 20 years old. I had gone to Antelope Valley Junior College in Lancaster and Chaffee Junior College in Altaluma for the express purpose of meeting girls. I had no interest in higher education, but after finishing high school, it occurred to me that if I wasn't in school, I wasn't going to meet any, so I re-enlisted, quote, at Chaffee, I met Kay Sherman. We dropped out of school, started living together, and got married. I went to work for a company called Nile Running Greeting Cards. Their line consisted of mostly silk-screened greetings designed for elderly women who liked flowers. I worked in the silkscreen department, and after a while, wound up designing a few of the floral horrors myself. Then came a part-time job writing copy and designing ads for local businesses, including a few beauties for the First National Bank of Ontario, California. I also had short stints as a window dresser and a jewelry salesman, and the worst one, I sold Collier's Encyclopedias door to door. That was truly wretched, but at least I got inside look at how that shit is done. First, they make you go to school for three or four days to memorize the sales pitch, from which you are not allowed to deviate since they tell you that they're, they're paid a lot of money to a psychologist somewhere who figured it all out. The guy who figured it all out, the one I had to memorize, should have his license revoked. Or do these guys ever get a license? They teach you psychological tricks to convince people who can't even afford a loaf of bread to pay 300 bucks for a set of books that they can't even read. For instance, when you go to pitch a deal and you have the sales contract on your clipboard, you should hold the pen under your thumb at the top of the board near the clip. When you hand the clipboard to the person, Sir, why don't you just take a look at uh, what it says right here. You release your thumb and let the pen roll down the clipboard into the guy's hand. And before he knows what the fuck happened to him, he's got the contract and the pen in his hand. Then the idea was to unfurl a rolled up piece of oil cloth with a photo on it showing what this incredible plywood bookcase with books sticking out of it would look like in his home. Then I would let him hold an actual book, the one that had the plastic overlays of the human body. I lasted a week. In the world of professional entertainment, I wasn't faring much better. I was working weekends with a four-piece lounge bound called Joe Pierino and the Mellow Tones at Tommy Sandy's Club in Sahara in San Bernardino. The management allowed us to play one twist number per night. The rest of the night we were supposed to play Happy Birthday, Anniversary Waltz, and On Green Dolphin Street. I wrote a white dinner jacket 
and bow tie and black pants and we sat on a bar stool and played the electric guitar i got so sick of it that i quit put the guitar in, in the case stuck it behind the sofa and didn't touch it for eight months one of the other great jobs was as a rhythm guitarist in a pickup band at a Christmas dance in a Mormon recreation hall. The room was decorated with wads of cotton hanging on black thread snowballs. Get it? The band consisted of sax, drums, and guitar. I borrowed a fake book so I could follow the chord changes since I didn't know any of the tunes. The sax player was, in civilian life, a Spanish teacher from the local high school. He had no sense of rhythm and couldn't even count the tunes off, but he was the leader of the band. <laughs> I didn't even know anything about Mormons at the time, so during a break, when I lit up a cigarette, it was as if the devil himself had just made a rare appearance. A bunch of guys looked like they weren't even ready to shave yet, started flailing over to me and in a brotherly sort of way, escorted my ass out the door. I knew I was going to love show business if I ever got into it. Let's get into show business. At that time, there was a place called the Pow Recording Studio in, don't laugh, Cucamonga, California. It was established by an amazing gentleman named Paul Buff. Page 42. Cucamonga was a blotch on the map represented by the intersection of Route 66 and Archibald Avenue. On those four corners, we had an Italian restaurant, an Irish pub, a malt shop, and a gas station. North of Archibald was an electrician shop, a hardware store, and the recording studio. Along the street was a Holy Roller Church, and up the block from that was a grammar school. Buff had lived in Cucamonga before enlisting in the Marines. While serving, he decided to learn electronics so that when he got out, he could apply that what he had learned and build his own recording studio. He got out, rented a place at 8040 Archibald Avenue, and set out to change the direction of American popular music. He didn't even have a mixing console, so he built one out of an old 1940s vanity. He removed the mirror right in the middle where the cosmetics would have gone and installed a metal place with a with Boris Karloff knobs on it. He built his homemade five track half inch tape recorder at the time when the standard of the industry was mono. I think only Les Paul had an eight track then. Buff was able to overdub the same way Les Paul could, but in a more primitive manner. He wanted to become a singer-songwriter, so he listened to uh, all the latest hit records, figured out what the hooks were, and through a mysterious process created his own little hook-laden replicas. He thought, he, he taught himself how to play the five basic instruments of rock and roll. Drums, bass, guitar, keyboards, and alto saxophone then taught himself how to sing. He made master tapes of finished songs, then dove into Hollywood and attempted to lease them to Capitol, Delphi, Dot, and Hollywood Sound. Some of these tunes actually became, quote, regional hits, end quote. 
Tijuana Surf with Paul multi-tracking himself became a long running number one record in Mexico. I wrote and played guitar on the B-side, an instrumental called Grinion Run. It was released on original sound under the name of the Hollywood Persuaders. I worked with him for about a year until he got into financial trouble and was in danger of losing his studio. So, remember the really cheap cowboy movie that my high school English teacher wrote the script for in 1959? After endless delays, Run Home Slow, starring Mercedes McCambridge, was completed and scored in 1963. I even got paid for it. Not all of it, but most of it. I took part of the money and bought a new guitar and used the rest to, quote, buy, end quote, PAL records from Paul. In other words, I agreed to take over his lease and the rest of his debt. Meanwhile, my marriage fall apart. I filed for divorce, moved out of the house on G Street, and into Studio Z, beginning a life of obsessive overdubbage, nonstop, 12 hours a day. I had no food, no shower or bathtub, just an industrial sink where I could wash up. I would have starved in there if it hadn't been for Motorhead Sherwood. I knew him from Lancaster. He came to Cucamonga and didn't have a place to stay, so I invited him to move into the studio with me. Motorhead had a way with cars and also played the saxophone, a useful combination. When the mothers were finally formed, he worked for me as a roadie and later joined the band. One day, Motorhead by some illicit means, acquired a box of foodstuffs from a mobile blood bank. He got some instant mashed potatoes. I still don't know why a blood mobile would carry instant mashed potatoes, but that's where he said he got them. Some instant coffee and some honey. By then, I had landed a weekend gig at a place called the Village Inn in Sun Village, 80 miles away. The pay came to $14 a week, 7 bucks per night, minus gas. With that, I bought peanut butter, bread, and cigarettes. One week, we splurged and bought a whole brick of Velveeta. Going back home to the Village of the Sun, out in back of Palmenade, Palm, Palmdale, where the turkey farmers run, I done made up my mind, and I know I'm going to go to this, I go to Sun Village. Good God, I hope the wind don't blow. It'll take the paint off your car, and it'll wreck your windshield too. I don't know how people stand it, but I guess they all do, because they're all still there, even Johnny Franklin too, in the Village of the Sun, Village of the Sun, Village of the Sun, Sun Village to you, what you gon' do? Little Mary and Teddy and Thelma too, where Palmdale Boulevard cuts through, past Village Inn and Barbecue. I heard it ain't there. I hope it ain't true. When the stumbler's gonna go to watch the lights turn blue. Village of the Sun from the album Roxy and Elsewhere, 1974. When I was in high school in Lancaster, I formed my first band, The Blackouts. The name derives from when a few of the guys, after drinking peppermint schnapps, purchased illicitly by somebody's older brother, blacked out. This was the only R&B band in the entire Mojave Desert at the time. Three of the guys, J. 
Johnny Falcon, Carter Franklin, and Lyle Lyot were black. The Salzer, the Salazar brothers were Mexican, and Terry Wembley represented the other oppressed people of the earth. Lancaster was a boomtown then. There was a huge influx of te te technical employees, guys like my dad, who dragged their families into this godforsaken place in order to work on the m missile projects of at Edwards Air Force Base. The original inhabitants, sons and daughters of alfalfa farmers and weed store owners, held all the newcomers in low esteem. We were the people from down below, a term used to describe anyone who was not from the high desert area where Lancaster was located. Page 46. The pecking order at the high school was pretty laid out. The members of the social elite, lettermen and cheerleaders, were all reproductive byproducts of the coots and the codgers that ran the local feed and grain business the lowest rung on the ladder in this 1957 social arrangement was reserved for the sons and daughters of the black family who raised turkeys in the area beyond palmdale sun village only slightly above that rung was a little slot for the Mexican. The fact that this was a, quote, integrated, end quote, band disturbed a lot of people. The distress was compounded by the fact that prior to my arrival, someone had put on a rhythm and blues show at the fairgrounds. Legend had it that, quote, colored people brought dope in, in the valley when they did not that darn show and we never gonna let that kind of music round here again end quote i didn't know about any of this shit when i was put in the band together anyway my part-time job in high school was working in a record store for a nice lady named elsie sorry i can't remember her last name who liked R&B. As you can imagine, in a town like that, paying gigs for a integrated R&B band, crew uh, uh, were few and far between. One day I got a great idea. I decided to promote my own gig, a dance, at the local women's club to promote uh, uh, club hall and I asked Elsie to help me. I wanted her to rent the hall for us, and she agreed to do so. Now, I'm pretty sure about this. It was uh, Elsie who had promoted the original colored person show with, opti with optional chemical commodity and I didn't fully grasp the local socio-political ramifications of all this when I asked her to book the hall. So everything was set. The band rehearsed out in Sun Village to the Harris's living room. We had our song list. We were selling tickets. Everything was fine. The evening before the dance, while walking through the business district about 6 o'clock, I was arrested for vagrancy. I was kept overnight in jail. They wanted to keep me long enough to cancel the dance. Just like, a, uh, like in a rally, bad 19... Like in a really bad 1950s teenage movie. It didn't work. Elsie and my folks got me out. The bug. We played the dance. It was a lot of fun. 
we had an enormous turnout of black students from Sun Village. Motorhead Sherwood was the hit of the evening. We did this weird dance called The Bug, where he pretended that some creature was tickling the fuck out of him and rolled around on the floor trying to pull it off. When he got it off, he threw it at girls in the audience, hoping they would flop around on the floor too. A few of them did. After the dance, as we were packing stuff in our studio, the trunk of Johnny Franklin's um, wasted blue Studebaker, we found ourselves surrounded by a large containment contingent of lettermen. The white horror. Eager to cause physical harm to our disgusting little integrated band. This was a mistake because upon seeing the gathering of the ugly jackets, a few dozen, quote, villagers, end quote, started hauling chains and tire irons out of their trucks with a look in their eye that said, the night is young. The letterman folded in total humiliation. God, they're so sensitive about that sort of thing and went home to their coots and co codgers. They, re they remained hostile to me and other guys in the band all the way through to graduation. Now, upstanding young gentleman. were pretty well plugged into the cheerleading squad and I know I'm not imagining this those girls did not like me very much and so it came to pass during a school assembly to inaugurate the new gymnasium one of these maidens name omitted because I'm a nice guy was given the honor of leading the entire student body in a rousing rendition of the school song, a truly nauseating piece of poetry, sung to the tune of Tura Lura Lura. It's an Irish lullaby. A song so special that it had to be sung standing up in order to fulfill her mission. Mrs. Namamitted had to get the entire crowd on its feet, even me, which led her to shout sneeringly to the microphone, everybody up. And that means you too, Frank Zappa.